Okay, everybody have their coffee? <laughs> um, we've uh, designed this, Ro Robert, just, just stand up again, because Robert not only is facility, Robert is going to, you'll, you'll hear a lot from Robert tomorrow especially, but Robert and I have put together um, the two days morning main sessions here, basically to try to, as, uh, as Perry had said, not confront every single issue that everybody has, because there are lots of them. Um, and uh, there obviously we're not going to solve all of these particular kinds of questions. Um, there is also, of course, whenever one tries to discuss methodology and alternative methodologies, there's of course a giant elephant in the middle of the room, which is the dominant kind of methodology that we use in political science. We're not even going to really be able to talk extraordinarily in detail about that. So I'm going to be assuming stuff. Both Robert and I are going to be sort of assuming some background stuff. If at different points during the days, we say things that strike you as not actually being particularly good assumptions to make, write it down. We'll have specific question points throughout the two days where we'll say, okay, discussion about what we've just said. Feel free to bring that up. One of the conveniences that we've availed ourselves of in putting this together is, again, assuming that if I say Popperian falsification, that people are going to have some vague idea of what Popperian falsification is. If not, feel free to ask us at one of those designated periods where we can then come back and talk about these things. Um, Popperian falsification? Okay, all right. Well, I'll make sure I'll do the 30-second thing when I get to that point. But what I want to start off with, and actually I want to start off in a slightly different sort of place. I want to start off with a, an initial exercise here to get us uh, moving around a little bit. And we have somewhat close quarters in here, but we are actually going to divide out into, into four groups and have a little quick discussion. Um, I, I have no idea who the woman on the left is. Uh, it was just a picture <laughs> of someone reading, which I think often comes to mind when we think about interpretive methods reading and text, which is fine. But the other two should be people who you may not be familiar with their faces, but you are probably familiar with their names. Gentleman in the middle is Ludwig Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, great inspiration to lots of people doing sort of quote unquote interpretive work. Gentleman on the right? That is Clifford Gears. Exactly. But that's the one on his website. That's the one on his website. So that's the one that I have up there. So. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 sort of it's 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 like the fat Elvis skinny Elvis problem. Yeah, there's 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 always ambiguities. But regardless, right? Some and 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 there is a, there is actually though a, a a somewhat serious point underlying this, which is of course most of the people that we tend to draw on when we talk about interpretive political science are not political scientists. They come from other places. They come from philosophy. They come from anthropology. They come from the wilds of the internet. They come from other places, right? Because even though there are certainly bits and pieces of an indigenous interpretive tradition within political science, it is fragmentary. And part of what we want to do, part of what I want to do during the course of the day is I want to suggest how fragmentary it is and try to suggest an alternative language for talking about some of these issues to try to fill in some of the, some of the gaps between the fragments that we've sort of come up with. So where to start? Um, the place that I generally start thinking about these things is to think about the kinds of existing dichotomies that we have in the field at the moment for talking about the ways in which we do research. Right? We have this language, which this exercise we're going to do here for the next half hour or so, I hope will illustrate exactly how inadequate this language is. Uh, but this is sort of the language that we are given Right? when we take our, our uh, PhD level methodology courses, which after the first two weeks on research design usually quickly devolve into a statistical methods class. Right? I mean, that's usually what happens with these things. But uh, so we, we are left with a set of these, di these dichotomous terms that we use to talk about how we do work. These are the things that are commonplace at present points in time. If you look through sort of journals in the field and you look at how people talk about and try to situate what they're doing, these are the kinds of terms that they use. These are also how when we ourselves try to define our own projects, we tend to talk about them in these terms or we think about them in these terms, even if we don't like to think we think about them in these terms. It's amazing how if you're challenged on doing something that doesn't look like the mainstream, you end up with one of these responses that I'm going to talk about in a second or comes to mind. Then you're like, wait a minute, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean to say I was doing quality. No, I didn't want that word, but that's the word that came to mind. Right? There are reasons for this involving professional socialization and so on and so forth. Um, and what's interesting about these terms is that they're dichotomies. Right? The way we tend to think about how we do research within the field tends to be very dichotomous. We have sets of paired opposites. As is usual with dichotomies, there is a clear positive term and a clear negative term. 
um, and you'll see this very clearly in the next couple of slides. In fact, you'll see it very particularly on the next slide where I talk about the first dichotomy, which is quantitative versus qualitative. I don't think there's any real illusion in terms of the dominant uh, discourse in the field, which one is the positive term and which one is the slightly lesser term. Right? So there is this idea that we think about our research as being divided up into quantitative and qualitative kinds of research. Now, we got some people who hadn't seen Popper or didn't know Popperian falsification. I'm assuming everybody's heard of KKV, King, Cohane, and Verba. Yes? Um, so we have this argument that they make, which is that qualitative and quantitative are basically the same. And surprise, surprise, qualitative turns out to be small and quantitative. Shock. Um, so we have this. Now, there is, what's interesting is that that dichotomy, though, there are people who certainly argue the opposite side, right? Including, we read a piece by David, uh, no, Brady. It wasn't Collier's piece. It was, it was uh, Henry Brady's piece. But uh, he and David Collier have written a number of things on this. You have Alexander George and Andrew Bennett, uh, mostly in, in more IR terms. You have Colin and Miriam Fendius Elman, who've written about some of this stuff arguing that, in fact, no, there is such a thing as an autonomous qualitative logic, right? So trying to play within this qual-quant division. That said, it is still, I think, pretty clear that the quantitative stuff is kind of preferred within the discipline as a whole. And if not even the use of numbers, then it is the quantitative techniques that are preferred, the quantitative ways of thinking about case selection and so on and so forth. So we have that dichotomy. Now, there's another one that often floats around in here, which is this dichotomy between explaining and understanding. Right? which is this idea that we have two different ways of making sense of the world. We have a way of explaining things, and we have a way of understanding things. Now, poli-sci, as a field, as a discipline, has been wrapped up with the notion of explaining for a long, long time. If you read any of the, uh, any of the uh, historiography about the creation of political science as a discipline in the late 19th, early 20th century, this is one of the major issues. The idea that, well, we're not historians because we're not just interested in explaining stuff and understanding stuff. We're interested in explaining things. We're interested in having some sort of scientific generalization about stuff. All right, so this, this has been a, a long-standing thing with political science. Now, as I said, there are always uh, have been this set of interventions by people who are not actually political scientists. And those interventions have come from outside, right? Some names that you might be familiar with. Peter Winch's idea of a social science in relation to philosophy thin little book that often gets utilized even though it was written in 1958 to begin with but is still you know sort of seminal statement of this stuff Clifford Geertz whose picture we saw before um, Charles Taylor philosopher interpretation of the science as a man there's some various sort of things that he's written again people who are not within political science who get drawn on for these things hmm? Originally, or, yes. Though I think that certainly these days he's, he, he's much more of a sort of a political theorist or even just even straight up philosopher. So he certainly made a, a bit of a move. Um, but you've got this idea that it's these things that are sort of self-defined as outside, saying, okay, we're going to bring in these other kinds of notions. And part of that is because this this equation between poli sci and explain has been has been so sort of roundly established. Explaining does tend to be preferred if you say that you're not trying to explain stuff. Uh, to most political scientists, I think, I mean, outside of this room, right, you'll probably get some blank stares. Uh, you'll get some sort of head scratching and some, uh, so that's interesting raw data that you're providing me with, right? <laughs> so there are, there are some ways in which there's certainly a slant between these two, these two kinds of dichotomies. Now, given that this is a workshop on interpretive methods and methodologies, uh, why am I not throwing out the term interpretive at this point at the beginning of the day? And this is very deliberate. This is actually the last slide that I have all day that has the word interpretive on it. Right? And there's a reason for that. Well, several reasons. One reason is because this is a relatively new term within political science. This is not something that we have a long-standing kind of familiarity with. This is not something that you can expect lots of, lots of, of recognition for. If you sort of say, I'm doing interpretive political science, you then sort of have to explain. If you say, I'm running a regression, you don't have to explain it. Everybody's like, yeah, OK, cool. I get that. Well, I'm interpreting. Well, what does that mean? Right? So, it's a, so there, there's some, some ambiguity there. The meaning of the term itself is actually kind of unclear. Right? Especially with respect to these existing sorts of dichotomies. I mean, you can have, and we still have these discussions about whether interpreting, whether interpreting is necessarily qualitative, whether there can be an interpretive explanation. Right? So we're not sure how this fits together with these kinds of existing terms that float around that we use to talk about our research practices. It's also kind of unclear what isn't interpretive. I mean, the, the, the nice thing, sort of cognitively speaking, about a dichotomy is it's pretty easy to tell what the other is because it's opposed to something. So you can say qual, quant. You can say explain, understand, right? It's easier. Interpretive, it's not quite sure what's not interpretive. 
And so it, 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 the term itself is sort of a, a little bit of a fuzzy conceptual cloud. And it's also very unclear whether interpretive precludes other kinds of commitments. Can you be both an interpretivist and a statistician at the same time? Can you be both an interpretivist and a discourse analyst at the same time? It's unclear. And it's unclear largely because the terms have not been particularly well and sharply defined. Um, and part of this I'm going to posit is because of these the problems with the terms qualitative, quantitative, and explain and understand themselves, which I don't think do the kind of conceptual or disciplinary work that we want them to do. All right. And in order to illustrate this, what I would like you to do, I'd like to take these dichotomies, and I want to see sort of what they actually do in practice a little bit. So take these dichotomies. What we're going to do is we're going to do a quick exercise here for about 10 minutes, um, fleshing out the logic of these various positions. You notice I've tossed these terms out, and I haven't defined them yet. Right? And I'm doing that very deliberately. I want, I'm going to divide us up into small groups, and we're going to try to define what these terms mean in combination. Um, now, when you do this exercise, I want you to think part of the reason, there's lots of reasons why we assigned Weber. I'm constitutionally incapable of giving a presentation which Weber is not mentioned <laughs> at least twice. Um, and Weber will show up again later. And there's a picture of the later Weber. Um, you'll see that. He'll descend from the heavens onto the slide. Um, the, uh, I want you to think about these kinds of combinations and these terms not as, not as sort of fuzzy operational things that you actually do stuff with. I want you to think of them as artificially pure. Figure out what the logic of these things is, as, as artificially pure as you can make them. So what I'm going to do is divide you up into four groups and have you kind of define, but not define the four individual terms. See, two dichotomies, of course, suggest a two by two table. Doesn't it? Right? Because two dichotomies, which look sort of like they should be orthogonal to each other, suddenly produces, oh, look, a handy two by two table, which I happen to have one of right here. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, between uh, Jennifer and Akiko, we're going to split right there. And that split would then go then between the two of you, right? Split. And the way it's going to work is from Jennifer around inside of the table, you are group one. Uh, you folks, back to the gentleman in the vest. I didn't catch your first name, though. Rogan. Rogan. You are group two. From, uh, is it John? Joe. Joe, over. You are group three. And then you folks seated at the table here are group four. I'm going to put four over here. I'm going to put one over here. Two and three can consolidate in those back corners. Like I said, it's a small room, but we'll make do with it. Um, those are your assignments. One, two, three, and four. What I want you to do is I want you to spend about 10 minutes trying to inhabit that combination and tell me what it looks like. Tell me what kind of work fits there. Think of examples of things that would go there and how you would characterize them. And in particular, if you think of what logic say, what it looks like to be doing explaining work that is quantitative, then tell me why that's different from these other things. Right? Think about these things in terms of differences. Why, what is distinctive about these individual boxes? So 10 minutes, scatter. Four is over here. One is over here, two goes back there, three goes back there. Unfortunately, in terms of the time we have, I mean, I feel like we could probably do this for another hour, <laughs> right? But there's more we need to get to. So, so here is what I would, hello, folks on the floor, hello. <laughs> Cecilia, this means you. <laughs> no, no, what I want, I, rather than moving people around right yet, but I would like, actually, you, you, you do, do we want to move back in our regular places? What are we going to do next? We need to report out from what it is that, we, that we've got. But some people are not sitting on the floor, and their backs probably could use chairs. So why don't we re get back to where you were. Go ahead and move back, and then I will ask people to sort of quickly report out for their group. No, this is mine, yeah. I saw, I saw, where did my, where did my jacket go? I got it. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
Okay. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this in uh, in in reverse uh, reverse numerical order. So I want to start off. I want to start off with group four, and I would like group four to briefly somebody from group four or some people from group four briefly tell me what your group came up with as the distinctive logic or distinctive mode of inquiry that you find at the intersection of understanding and qualitative. And if you have any specific examples, feel free to give those as well. So just, I don't want a long dissertation, but you know, <laughs> something short and quick. So apparently understanding and qualitative is about silence. No, um, We've been silent. okay, that may be true, but in order for the exercise to go, what did you come up with? Or what did you talk about? Even if you didn't come up with anything. Okay. Okay. Why? Why did you not find it? Why did you not find that a helpful way of thinking about the work that you think should fit in that box? Okay. Okay. So, so, so part of the issue that, that that this group sort of wrestled with is it's hard to define in positive terms what understanding means because so much of what we would put in there either gets sucked over into explaining or turns into journalism or, of course, the other great epithet that's tossed around in political science, just telling stories. Um, as, and that, and how many, how many and not, not, I don't want to show our hands, but how many people have had people say that about their work, right? No, you're just telling stories. You're not really doing stuff. You're just telling stories. Um, all right, so, so there is something kind of weird about trying to figure out what this category is. Did you think of any work that would sort of fit over there? Anything that would sort of make sense in there? Mm -hmm. that we couldn't really right. Uh, agree. Right, so there's no real clear examples that this group was able to come up with as people who fit in that box, uh, that, that it's, it's hard to figure out exactly what the positive logic of that would be. It's sort of a weird residual category in, in a lot of ways. Um, and again, if we remember that these things are hierarchized, that makes sense because we're talking about the intersection of the two recessive points of the, of the, the dichotomies. So that would, that, would, uh, that would make sense. But this language doesn't seem to be particularly helpful in terms of trying to, trying to figure this out. Now, this is awful good if you're trying to get lots of publications, because unclear language that nobody quite agrees on what it means can generate endless numbers of articles about these things, right? But it's running on ice. It doesn't get us anywhere, because that discussion could go on for days, and you wouldn't have anything more than you had at the outset. All right, so there's something weird about that quadrant. What about quadrant three? What did you folks come up with for the intersection of quantitative and understanding? So some kind of interpretation, though of course in a statistical context, interpretation is a very particular and restricted meaning. About sort of about because you can't just simply take the numbers and figure out whatever you want them to mean. There, there's a set of rules about how how we make this data do something. All right, um, but why why is that understanding rather than explaining? Why is giving a sense to uh, the arrangement of a data set understanding rather than explaining what's going on? We could have used another twenty or thirty minutes at least to figure that out. But mm -hmm. where we're stopping, I think, is at the point where those two categories collapse into each other. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that had we had time to talk further, we might have found that quantum call also collapsed. So again, the distinction doesn't seem to be particularly clear with, with helping us make sense of it. Defining an autonomous logic of understanding that would still use numbers or still have be in some sense quantitative is a, is a difficult thing to do. I would argue that probably has a lot to do with the fact that this, this understanding term that's getting us in trouble. Um, I wonder if the qual quant is any easier. What did group two have? Did you come up with anything? Were you able to define a, a separate logic for qualitative explanation?
sometimes people said also that quadrant two might also privilege smaller cases, although it need not do that. Somebody also suggested that quadrant two, as opposed to say one, uh, aspire to a kind of richness that mm -hmm. quadrant one would not aspire to. That whereas quadrant one would emphasize parsimony, quadrant two would emphasize uh, richness. But again, all of these things. But whether but richness is also obviously uh, a major part of quadrant four. Mm -hmm. and again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Canonical text, I mean, we thought about Alex Wentz's uh, major work as fitting both in two and four in some ways. And he's talking okay. about causation maybe in two, and he's talking about understanding or uh, constitutive relationships, rather, he might be in, in, in number four. Um, KKB, to some extent, aspires to colonize uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. two. Yeah. Um, it's the right word. Sure. Uh, KKV, Brady Collier, certainly. I mean, what's interesting, though, about the attempts to define this, in terms of if I take all of the things that, that, that you just said, which I think is, it's, some, it's easier to do the top row than the bottom row in political science because the top row there's already existing discussion about. People already spend time. There's already journal articles on this sort of stuff. So there are names. There are people who they, these are live debates that we can reference. Though what's interesting, as as, as your, your your comments make very clear, it's hard to define why, if you were doing a set of qualitative work with small numbers of cases, why you wouldn't just expand the number, except for perhaps getting a little more detail. And then maybe if we did a number of those, then you'd have a number of detailed cases, and then that would look very much like a larger end study. So there, there's, it's, hard, it's hard to define a, a compelling reason to stay in quadrant two. Well, the compelling answer to that question I think that we came up with is that um, there was something about quadrant two that also implied a kind of process-based right. right. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's process tracing or whether it's looking at mechanisms or you know, logics mm -hmm. of violence or something, that mm -hmm. will be probably in two. Right. Although, right. Also Right. So processes, constitutive relations, various other things. What's interesting is, that in order, it, notice what's happening. In order to try to define that box, too, as being different, we're importing other terms already. This is not enough. We need something else with other kind of philosophical and conceptual content to try to define what the autonomous logic of that box would be. And those are terms that I think there's less broad-based disciplinary familiarity with. Right, but we're, we're bringing in other stuff to try to articulate this. Because if you don't bring in those terms, then two kind of collapses into one. The same way that three and four kind of collapse. Did one have any problems? Uh, not, not terribly many, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we looked at the explaining understanding axis as a more epistemological axis and the quantitative qualitative axis as more about method. And the biggest distinction we could good, good. find between one and two was um, the size of the end and the extent to which you investigate causal mechanisms. So kind of that pers uh, parsimony versus uh, richness question. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what belonged in quadrant one, we thought that it was characterized by a focus on causality with the idea that there is an objective Archimedean view of the world and a fact value distinction that can be kind of meaningfully distinguished with an emphasis on fact, of course. We thought that it had included both the hypothetico deductivism and analysis of causal mechanisms approaches, although mm -hmm. the, the analysis is less detailed than in two. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have uh, the IBDB approach. Generally, you're going to run regressions, high degrees of generalization, um, broad correlation, cases weighted equally, which might not be the case in two. Um, the, the faith in cumulative knowledge and explanation um, as leading to predictive possibility. There, some folks argued that there's a greater ability to, or a greater need to infer mm -hmm. in one than in two, for example. 
And we thought that some examples of this would, of course, be um, voting behavior models, the Correlates of War Project, mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. things on democracy. <laughs> In which, now what's interesting, all, with all of the various sort of things that you put together, what, what, there's two things I want to pull out that are kind of striking about that. Number one, how easily it rolls off the tongue, <laughs> right? Because we know this package. We know this package very, very well. We know this package even if we don't do it. But we. APSR. Yes, we, 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 we know this package because we all subscribe to the APSR because they keep sending it to us. Um, <laughs> And, and we know this package because we all went through dissertation committees and defenses and job talks and various things in which people would ask questions about what your IV and your DV was. And if you were doing something that didn't have those, then you get that moment of dialogue of the deaf, you know? Like, uh, Cuisinart? I mean, it does, it does, it, it's hard to figure out. Or, or you know, K? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work, right? But this is the default presupposition in a lot of ways, that that, that box is there. Now, what also is interesting is that notice how generous box one can be. They can define themselves as expansive. They can bring everybody else on board. You, you're understanding things? We can bring your understanding of the local meaning of particular things. We'll just plug them into a regression equation and show how it's generally valid. Right? We can take you folks on board. You're giving us detail, richness. And we're going to take that and we're going to plug that into a bigger model to make sure that we've got something a little more generally valid. Uh, you folks who are doing qualitative understanding, well, you know, as long as you've got some systematic observations, we can take you too. <laughs> right? This is a standard. Anybody who's ever done any sort of social power analysis, we know this. We know the dominant are going to be generous. Right? We know how that works. But this is the default presupposition. And the contention that I would like to make is that understanding and explaining and quantitative qualitative is insufficient to define any of those other three boxes as philosophically or methodologically meaningful on their own. There is not sufficient resources in the vocabulary that we have to define those things separately. Because what happens is all of those things can then be incorporated, more or less, into a conjunction of quantitative and explaining. This debate which I would argue is most of the mainstream debate about methodology in political science, not all of it, but most of it, does not get us very far. And one might, if one were being a little more conspiratorial about it, uh, one might say that there's a way in which we're all playing with a rigged deck, because the deck is set up to pull us into the quadrant one. There's not sufficient resources here. So the question then for us, and the question that I want to then sort of talk about for the rest of the day, or have us talk about for the rest of the day, is what are the sufficient resources to actually define conceptually, philosophically, methodologically, what we're doing and why it's not that? Why what we're doing is distinctive, is equally scientific in its own way, but is a different kind of being scientific, is a different kind of logic of inquiry that doesn't simply collapse into large end quantitative regression and is not simply a deficient form of large end quantitative regression. That there's more to it than that. And in reading over people's comments from uh, questions that people had put in for the workshop and looking at people's uh, initial applications and such, this is obviously a question that's on all of our minds. I do not pretend to have answers to this. Well, I do sometimes pretend to have answers, but I'm not going to pretend to have an answer right now. Um, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say we need a different vocabulary. And what I want to do for the next little while here is I want to present an alternative vocabulary. And we're going to play around with it for a couple of hours. And we're going to see whether that vocabulary does a better job of explaining, understanding, quantitative, qualitative, with trying to perhaps hone in on what it is that we do. Now, in order to do this, what we've decided is we're going to cut the presentation up. I'm going to cut the presentation up into two pieces. I'm going to give the first part now. We're going to have a coffee break. We'll come back and have a little Q&A. And then I will get to the second part. Because otherwise, we'd have to sit here until 11 o'clock before we got more coffee. For some of us, that's going to be a difficult transition, including myself. Coffee's almost gone. So uh, that is pretty much how we will do it. And I will record this separately because I will also podcast this. So it will be up on my website, which I will give you uh, information for a little bit later. But let me get this started. All right, so I have titled the talk that I want to give today, I have titled it A More Adequate Lexicon, Some Lessons from the for Social Research from the Philosophy of Science. I will talk in a minute about why I go to the philosophy of science to try to think about some of these things, why I think this is a useful place to go. But I want to dwell for just a second on the word lexicon, um, which is a word that even though I'm not going to go into this in great detail today, it is a word that the later Thomas Kuhn liked very, very much. 
We're familiar with Kuhn. We've heard of Kuhn. His name gets tossed around in the field an awful lot. Usually, the way philosophers usually get tossed around in political science, right? Out of context quotation followed by out of context quotation followed by conclusion they wouldn't agree with. Um, that's usually what you get. Kuhn, of course, hugely skeptical of the idea that he had provided any kind of roadmap to how to be a real science. Says this numerous times doesn't stop him from being appropriated this way. Similarly, Lakatoche, et cetera, right? So people who's doing philosophy of science who get used in these sort of weird ways. But later Kuhn had this really interesting understanding of, of what he called a scientific lexicon. And Kuhn argued in his later days that the lexicon that a particular scientific community has is what makes it sensible for them to pose certain kinds of problems. This does not mean that lexicons cannot be partially translated into each other, but it does mean that particular languages form the kinds of questions that it is sensible to ask. Qual, quant, explain, understand is a lexicon that does not allow us to frame the questions that I think we need to ask, which is why I think we need another one, which is what I'm designed to do here. Now, philosophy of science, I enter into with a specific, so there's a little bit of trepidation. Devore, do you have a quick question? No, actually, this isn't some of it. If you look at Kuhn's, uh, the, collection, the last collection of his essays called The Road Sense Structure, um, he has a few of, a few, uh, The Road Sense Structure. Uh, it's a book that is basically collecting his work since uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. There are a couple of essays in there, including an outline for an essay he never finished, which would have been fantastic, but he never finished it. Um, he's got a sketch of it in, in one of the papers. Um, and, and I, 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 it's, there's a delicious historical irony to the fact that later Kuhn is actually really helpful in ways that early Kuhn isn't for political science, right? Because early Kuhn, like most of the other philosophers of science, was dealing with physics where they have, you know, empirical success that needs to be explained. Uh, we don't, so it's weird to put it in there. But later Kuhn actually helps in, some, in ways that, that early Kuhn doesn't. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that later. But, let me say for a second here, because I, I go into philosophy of science here with a little bit of trepidation because of the way it's been misused in political science. Um, we misuse philosophy of science all the time. In particular, we misuse philosophy of science because we think that philosophers of science are supposed to provide us with an instruction manual for how to do research, how to be a science. There are approximately zero philosophers of science who are actually interested in providing a manual for how to, be, how to do science. That's not their game. That's not what the philosophy of science is. That's not what philosophers of science do. Um, this is particularly misleading, uh, this notion, when we start to use it in political science, because by saying instruction manual, we assume that there may be a single thing called the scientific method. And if we just follow the scientific method, then we will, in fact, achieve the promised land of science, in which you get lab coats, lots of money from governmental agencies, and the ability to be absolutely secure in your conclusions. This promised land does not exist. Um, even among the quote unquote hard sciences, I mean, physicists and biologists don't agree on how to do science. Biologists don't agree among themselves how to do science. Neither do physicists in some ways, right? There's lots of scientific methods. So this idea that there's a scientific method, and how many times have you seen that phrase used in various kinds of political science articles? Or you'll get a methodology class and someone will say, now we're gonna talk about the scientific method for studying politics. And I always wanna stand up and ask the obnoxious, which one exactly, question in the back, because there's lots of them. Um, of course, why do people do this? Because science is the trump card in disciplinary debates. You know, you have insight, but I, I have science. All right, stand back. I'm going to use the science now, and I'm going to make a recommendation that's going to be more secure than your opinions or whatever else. Right? So people go and they use this. This is a highly inadequate use as well, because philosophers of science are not really concerned anymore to define what science is. That's an old debate. That's an old debate that was current in the early part of the 20th century. They called it the demarcation debate. How do you know what science is and what non-science is? You see Hempel, the Hempel piece participates in this a little bit. He has some nice, uh, nice commentary about that. Uh, the Hempel piece is an old piece and the philosophy of science has moved on from that particular concern. I mean, there's a philosopher of science who we don't read in IR or in political science more generally, a guy named Larry Laudon, who uh, actually declared the demarcation problem dead, but he did that in 1981. <laughs> it's been a while, right? Um, but we still use it over here, right, as this trump card. Um, and we also have this nasty habit in political science of being very opportunistic in the way we deploy the philosophy of science. Um, the idea being, here's a position that I want to articulate anyway. I go find a philosopher of science who agrees with me. I cite them completely out of context and therefore gain legitimacy for what it is that I would like to do. Now, this has been going on for a very long time within political science. Um, 
there's a there's a particularly striking example of this within the subfield of IR, where you've had this this uh, deployment of Imri Lakatos, who is a a student and and critic of Karl Popper, who's this great sort of philosopher of science who we'll talk about a little later. Great in the sense of eminent, not great in the sense of he actually knew what he was talking about, but great in the sense of he's sort of you know you can't you can't get past him. Um, Lakatos gets tossed around. We get terms like research program that get tossed around all the time with international relations. Um, I don't know how other people's graduate training went, but uh, when you had the, the obligatory reading of the Lakatos essay, which is Methodology of Scientific Research Programs, uh, it is about 100 pages long, this essay, and people get no guidance for what to do with it. They read about the first few pages, they read the end, and then somebody lectures a couple of points that you're supposed to take away from it, and then you can say you've read Lakatos, and forevermore cite him out of context. Um, which is often what happens. But this is the way this works, right? We don't have systematic kind of philosophy of science backgrounds in terms of these things. The other way this gets misused in the discipline is we mistakenly think that the philosophy of science is a source for ideas about how politics work. We think that somehow you can go and look at philosophy of science and then use that as a source of models for how, how, how the political world operates, which I think is sort of doubly absurd. Um, it's absurd because why should we think that the world of practicing scientists would look like the world of politics? And it's also absurd because most philosophers of science are not actually interested in how scientists operate. They're interested in the transcendental logic that justifies how science and scientists operate. They're not trying to describe what scientists do for the most part. So it's really weird that we use it this way. But we do. We do. You get people citing Roy Bascar realist philosopher of science and saying, oh, Bascar talks about the ways in which, in which scientists produce knowledge out of the cultural and institutional endowment that they have. And then they use that to somehow create models of like labor politics. And so why would there be a parallel here? But people do this. Again, I think it's because of that derived legitimacy of science. Okay, we may not be able to actually use quantum physics. Well, some people think you can actually use quantum physics, but you know, most people will say, no, no, we can't do that. But we'll take philosophy of science. That we can use, right? You get this sort of reflected glory, as it were. So what do I think we should actually do with this, as opposed to these bad uses? Well, I think there is actually a really good uh, benefit of using the philosophy of science. I think the great advantage is that philosophers of science engage much more systematically in reflection on how you produce knowledge and what it means to produce knowledge than we tend to do within political science, which is by and large a very empirical discipline. Right? We don't do an awful lot of meta-reflection. It sometimes seems like we do, but as I'll argue in a second, what we do is a lot of meta-reflection on method. We don't do a lot of meta-reflection on methodology. We don't do a lot of, of meta-reflection on the status of our knowledge claims. We do a lot of meta-reflection on which kind of, of distribution should we use and what kind of sampling technique should we use. But we don't do a lot of meta-reflection on things like our facts correspond, our fact statements that correspond to a mind-independent world, or is the researcher somehow endogenous to the production of facts? That we don't spend an awful lot of time talking about. Um, the proper use of philosophy of science, if we sort of take what they're doing as a set of systematic reflections, may allow us to diffuse some fairly indefensible claims about objectivity and truth. There are a lot of those floating around, objectivity and truth being big clubs you can use to beat people over the head with, uh, which is what happens a lot within the discipline. You get these really weirdly misleading understandings of, well, quote unquote, the scientists do it this way. No, <laughs> that, that, that's not it, right? So we, we, arming ourselves, as it were, with some of this stuff is helpful to be able to diffuse that. Um, and in particular, what philosophers of science do, because their game, right, the game in philosophy of science is trying to figure out how certain kinds of implicit logics that people use to produce facts, how those logics operate and what their philosophical content is. Which means that philosophers of science end up thinking an awful lot about the implication of taking certain stances, certain kinds of ontological stances about our relationship to the world. We don't spend a lot of time in political science thinking about that, nor should we. That's not our, that's not our game. Our game is generating knowledge about politics, right? That's what we do. But because philosophers of science have spent time teasing out these implications, we can use some of what they've done to help show us the implication of some of these things and show us in particular that not all the implications culminate in regression equations, right? There's other ways of doing stuff. Maybe studying philosophy of science or talking about it a little bit, bringing a lexicon from it will help us get over physics envy, uh, which has been a huge problem within political science for a very long time, mediated by economics envy. Right? So physics envy, the economists envy the physicists, we envy the economists, and therefore by derived transitive property of envy, we envy the, uh, <laughs> the physicists. Physics is supposed to be the master science, right? which is interesting because even philosophers of physics are not so sure about that. 
so, let alone physicists themselves, most of whom gave up worrying about this stuff about 80 years ago because they said, oh, quantum theory, it's just weird. We, there is no natural language interpretation of quantum theory, so we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to say it works, and we just kind of do it. So most practicing physicists these days are, are almost atheoretical pragmatists in a lot of ways. It works, you put the equation together, you solve the thing out, there it goes. It's only the philosophers of science and the people who aren't in physics who worry about these foundational questions to the extent that we do. So we need to, we need to bear that in mind. But I think these are the proper uses of the philosophy of science. What do I think we can then get from this? I think there are three things in particular that, that, that we, can, we can gain from this. Three reasons why I think thinking about these terms of philosophy of science uh, and philosophy of science senses are relevant. The first is, of course, because the disciplining of what we do in political science relies sometimes explicitly, often explicitly, on claims about science and about scientific status. But science, of course, is somewhat of an empty signifier. It means stuff I like. And uh, it, is very, it doesn't have a positive meaning in a lot of ways. Thinking about philosophy of science can help us cash out the positive meaning and provide us with a response to some of these things. Secondly, thinking about the philosophy of science allows us to get off of the level where we're usually stuck in our discussions about things, which is the level of method and technique, and get to the level of methodology, the level of more fundamental assumptions about the status and character of knowledge. Because that is where I think the important differences are. They're at that level. If we stay at the level of method, which arguably is what explaining understanding qual quant does, then there is no alternative in the end to doing quadrant one because there isn't sufficient philosophical resources to really pull us back from that. The important differences happen at a different level of abstraction, and so that's what I need to get to. And, of course, the third thing that we learn from studying philosophy of science, and the thing that you can never repeat too often, is that philosophers of science do not actually have a consensus about these fundamental issues. There are lots of different versions of these things. There are certain constant questions that philosophers of science ask, but they cycle through the answers and recombine them in interesting ways and sort of keep going. There is no unified philosophy of science as a single entity. Much though, if you read the philosophers of science out of context and only read their introductions to their books and articles, they will claim that A, there is one, and B, it's theirs. But of course they will, right? It's a standard kind of disciplinary self-presentation. But we should not take that seriously as a truth claim. That is a particular kind of positioning claim. All right, so let me say a couple of things about each of these particular uh, why things matter. Let me talk a little bit briefly about science because it is a word that, as I said, is something of an empty signifier and doesn't tend to... A lot of us who are interested in doing work that is not quantitative explanation are sometimes a little gun-shy of the word science because it is used within the discipline to refer to a certain bundle of techniques. Um, so I suggest, since you can't get rid of it, it's right there in the title of the discipline, political science, right? It's over the door, as it were. And because it's over the door, you can always refer back to the thing on the lintel of the door. Hey, it says science. So all right, cool. I think that what we need is not to dispense with the word science, but to broaden the definition. So what I'm going to do here in this, this lexicon that I'm pulling from philosophy of science, I'm operating with a very broad understanding of what it means to be scientific. And all I mean by science is that science would basically have three characteristics. That scientific inquiry would be systematic inquiry as opposed to, I don't know, Glenn Beck. Um, you know, uh, the uh, op-ed pages of most major newspapers, which is not particularly systematic. Right? So, you know, let's just sort of throw some things out and see them not even make sense. There's a brilliant little YouTube video of this recent absurdity that Glenn Beck got into trying to spell oligarchy on the board and missing the G. And it's, it just makes no sense. But it's not at all systematic. But you can see how it's a particular kind of political pandering. It's like, oh, all right, cool. So we don't want to do that. We want our, our accounts to be somewhat more systematic. Uh, science is also, in a sense, come on, battery work, communal which means that scientific findings, unlike other kinds of findings, have to be shared in some way. Simply coming to something on your own does not qualify it. You have to be able to share it. You have to be able to communicate it. There are public, shared, intersubjective processes and standards. Not that those are necessarily homogenous across the entire discipline, but that to have something be a scientific claim, it's got to be communally evaluatable. It can't just be based on your own intuition. It's got to be more than that to it. 
um, some way of validating or, or demonstrating that claim. And then the third is that science is empirical, by which I mean simply that science is ultimately about explaining something in the world, which is one of the things that differentiates science from pure logic or pure philosophy. And we're not philosophers, right? We use philosophy, but we're not philosophers. Primarily what we're interested in doing is we're in this discipline because we want to explain stuff about politics. We're interested in stuff about the social world. We want to explain what's going on in it. We want to figure out what's happening in the world. So those are, I think, the three kind of characteristics. Now, this should sound somewhat familiar to you because uh, it is closer to the German Wissenschaft. As I said, he would descend from heaven at a certain point. This is, of course, Max Weber. Um, and this is very close to the German usage uh, Wissenschaft, which is much broader than the English term science. Um, because it makes perfect sense in German for you to have something called Geisteswissenschaften, which doesn't translate very easily into uh, English, but catches up something of what we mean by, uh, the, the, by the, the, the humanities and the social sciences kind of put together. Um, and in German, that's a perfectly reasonable opposition. Talk about the Geisteswissenschaften and the Naturwissenschaften. Hard to characterize that in, in English because we end up with the sciences and the, and the arts. So the terms mean something. Again, lexicons, right? Mean something a little bit different. But the kind of definition I'm working with is more of this Weberian definition of science, which is one of the two reasons why we had you take a look at that Weber selection um, as preparation for this for today, so you can get a sense of sort of what that means. Um, and again, I think, Justin, this is a point we can come back to a little bit later. I think strategically, it is much more helpful for us to have a broad definition of science than for us to reject the label science. Reject the label science in this discipline is going to be very difficult to do. Broaden the definition of science, and in particular, broaden the definition of science by citing some of the existing, I use this word advisedly, scriptures that exist. You know, Hempel, oh gosh, you, you cited Hempel. I guess I have to listen to what you're saying. Weber, okay, we accept him. He's legit. So we have to, Weber's definition of science doesn't look like KKB. right? So that's important to bring up. So I think that having a broader definition of science is a better way to go here. Um, and why is this so darn important? Well, I think because this scientific status is not just important for those of us that like to loudly proclaim that we are political scientists as opposed to something else. It is also critical because whether we are explicit about it or not, every time we enter into discussions that are designed to differentiate opinion from knowledge, we are implicitly drawing on notions of science. Right? They're there. Right? When we start saying, why is this not just an opinion? This is somehow well-warranted knowledge. Well, that actually turns out to be William James's definition of science. So there are ways in which we are implicitly invoking this every time we try to differentiate what we do from mere opinion or from mere partisanship. In fact, any of us that have any kind of designs on creating policy-relevant knowledge are always using this even more explicitly because what makes our recommended policy for dealing with urban poverty or the balance of power in Southeast Asia better than somebody else's? Well, because it's scientific, right? So that claim is floating around in there in a lot of cases. Uh, not all of them, but it is often floating around. And in particular, it may not be floating around for you, but it's certainly floating around for your audience. Right, when you start to present these things. Oh, well, OK, is that just an, no, it's not an opinion. It's science. It's backed up by research. Cool, we can do it, right? So that's already there. So we need to know a little bit more about what this means, I think. This is something we've been laboring under in political science since the very beginning. You go back and again, you look at the historiography of the discipline, late 19th, early 20th centuries. This is the major point of differentiation. We want to be a science. We want to have knowledge that is somehow different than the existing historical and public law traditions. We want to do something else that has some different kind of validity to it. So again, this is uh, something that we may not have inherited a particularly good vocabulary for solving this problem within the discipline, but we certainly inherited the challenge where it's there and it's sort of one of those things that is not optional for us. It's part of the mental furniture of the discipline, so we kind of live there. We have to figure out some kind of response to this. All right, now if the first reason is to try to flesh out what that first reason for using philosophy of science is to really get at that broader definition of science and say sort of where do we fit within this constellation. The second reason is that a lexicon derived from the philosophy of science may help us get off of this method fetish we all have in the discipline and get down to the level of methodology, which we usually do not reach. Most of our discussions about these things are technical discussions. There's lots of them. There's volumes and pages about technical issues. That's not where the important distinctions, I think, actually lie. So what do I mean by this? Well, method, method is just basically a technique for gaining information. So getting stuff that you are getting. So counting, right? And what is statistics but complicated counting? Um, 
Interviewing, reading, these are methods, simple techniques for gathering information, gathering data, right? So which means that method is really about data collection and maybe some about data analysis, but that's kind of the level at which it operates. So when we have method discussions, which are very important discussions to have because eventually when you get off the plane to do your research, you've got to have some sense of what you're doing. So you do need method. I'm not saying we don't need method, but we need more than just method. We need something other than just the techniques for how you work with objects in the world. What we need is methodology. We need a rationale, philosophical rationale, for why you would use particular methods to answer particular questions, what the fit would be, why certain approaches would be appropriate for addressing certain kinds of questions and not others. There is no way that a discussion of method will ever get you there. Because, as a number of different people have so famously said, including Mansur Olson, once you have a hammer, that's a really good hammer. Everything starts looking like a nail. So if you have a particular method that you can use, well, then your answer is it's valid for every question, if you stay on the level of method. Because you can just keep using the technique over and over again. So hey, here's a particular kind of coalition building technique that works well in this House of Parliament. Maybe it'll work for all Houses of Parliament. Maybe it'll work for all legislatures. Maybe it'll work for all human social interaction in general. <laughs> right? Because there's nothing to stop it on the level of method. Because no what method doesn't give you an answer to why the technique is appropriate for a particular question. It just tells you how to do it. What we need, in other words, is we need more systematic reflection about not technique, but about research design and about the status of empirical claims, which we actually don't have an awful lot of discussion about. What you will often get is people will try to talk about doing something different than mainstream political science. They will introduce different kinds of methods, say ethnographic methods. And then they'll sort of get near the end of the article or the end of the book or, or the, the case selection part of the book and then they'll sort of say and then I went out and I selected some cases that got me some variation on certain causal factors so that I could sort of come up with a general account. and you're like wait a minute what just happened there you know, it's sort of a dissociation um, you get within IR which is where I where I come from so I'm more familiar with this in IR than in other things there's been this big incursion in international relations in the last 20 years of what's called constructivist IR theory and uh, what constructivists are famous for doing at least they were until very, very recently, is having a meta-theoretical part of their article in which they talked about thick process and constitution and the ways in which social meanings concatenated and didn't fit with various logic. And then the article would have a second section. The second section would say, I selected four cases so that I could get variation based on these things. And I came up with the following set of generalizable hypotheses. And then I went out and tested them according to uh, interviews that I conducted so that I could measure the extent to which people were socialized. And you're like, wait a minute, what just happened there? Right? And I think what happened there is that we don't really have a good sense of what it would mean to do research that has a totally different kind of research design. Right? And only recently have, have certain people, including Cecilia with a book that they just published uh, on, in, on constructivist methodologies, have started posing these questions. We didn't have a lot of posing of those questions within the field uh, before now. We really lack the vocabulary in a lot of ways. This is not our fault. This is not our fault. Part of the reason it's not our fault is because, as Perry rather exhaustively demonstrated, statistically even, um, by looking at every graduate program in the United States, pretty much, you know, a lot of them, good, good sampling of things, the, 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 number of, the number of programs where you actually have, have a required class in the philosophy of science? Required, required class in the philosophy of science? Standalone. Required standalone philosophy of science class. Uh, what was it, like two? Yeah, yeah. Minimal. Minimal. And what you usually get when you start drilling down and examining syllabi is you get a couple of weeks on philosophy of science at the beginning, which usually amounts to, well, often, often will amount to, let's talk about uh, popper and falsification and make sure that you have hypotheses. Okay, moving on. And then we spend 15 weeks on regression. Um, uh, sometimes we'll do more. You know, if we try to do you know, maybe five or six weeks. But again, any of us that are trying to teach this at this level real, I mean, even five or six weeks is not enough. It's not enough to really introduce this stuff. Certainly, you know, an hour and a half is not enough to introduce this stuff. But the point is we don't have this kind of broad disciplinary literacy. So if we want to write articles about these things and engage in conversations about this stuff, we have to do an awful lot of backfilling to try to explain what it is that we mean. So because the level of general, sort of general literacy within the discipline is reasonably low. And this is not helped by the fact that even the dissidents who say there are modes of inquiry other than large n quantitative regression that are valid on their own end up remaining on the level of method rather than on the level of methodology. So we have the qualitative method section of the APSA, which has largely devoted itself to thinking about techniques. 
and not really devoted itself to thinking about broad-based logics of inquiry. And the, be the best symbol of this. QMMR. QMMR? Oh, right. Yes. OK. But they added a bunch of M's, you know. Because um, they used to just be the qualitative methods section. And then they added in multi-method. Now, multi-method in a context in which we don't, in which we have a tacit, often unacknowledged, dominant methodology, multi-method simply means, all right, let's have alternative ways of doing the same old thing, right? In a lot of ways. So there's this sort of interesting kind of capture that even goes on in the title of the section. So we stay at that level. We, we sort of stay at this level of, of method rather than methodology. I'm going to argue for the whole rest of the day and you can disagree with me about this. In fact, Robert will disagree with me about this tomorrow. Um, so we will have a discussion about this. But my general position about this stuff is that if interpretivism is going to make a difference, if it's going to mean something to do interpretive social science, that difference must be methodological and cannot simply be about method. It cannot simply be about technique. Because technique is not sufficient to say, for instance, interpretive research is research that is experience near. I don't think that does much for us. Because then if I say I'm going to do experience near research, someone can come along and say, OK, so sample a bunch of experience near places, use them as, use them as some, some particular illustrations of a process, and then we'll aggregate up. Because we haven't touched the level of research design and methodology. Um, and as you'll see, I, I guess I lied before. I said there wasn't going to be another slide that had the word interpretive in it. So there was one. Um, now I don't think there's any more slides that have interpretive in it. Because I'm not so sure that the word interpretive does the work we need it to do. And the vocabulary that I'm going to derive here is actually not going to use the word interpretive. And one of the open questions that we'll talk about later on during this session is where interpretive fits in terms of these things. Um, it is important also, as I said, you can never repeat this too often. There is no consensus among philosophers of science. So brief potted history of the philosophy of science in the 20th century uh, starts off like this. Once upon a time, in a place called Vienna, which is a nice city, um, there were a group of people who called themselves, creatively enough, the Vienna Circle, because they were in Vienna. And uh, these were a bunch of folks who articulated a particular approach to thinking about knowledge, which was called, by their own light, they called it positivism. Um, the, the reason I set this story in Vienna, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, is because those people who were you know, more schlick and these folks who were doing in this, this particular circle, articulated a vision of knowledge which actually doesn't directly correspond to what the term positivism means in political science these days at all. So Vienna Circle positivism was something very different. Vienna Circle positivism, of which you've seen Hempel, and Hempel is a very good illustration of this kind of Vienna Circle positivism. The basic idea here is that knowledge is deduced from basic observations. Right? Hempel has that striking statement about how a law is just a statement of an empirical regularity. Right, which is a very profound philosophical statement. which has a lot to do with this goal that the positivists had. If you look at Hempel's footnotes clearly, you can see that many of Hempel's goals have to do with the fact that he's writing in Vienna in the early part of the 20th century and is very concerned about things like Nazism and fascism and wants to say, you know, destiny of a race is not a scientific concept, so we should get rid of that. You know, so this is the goal that a lot of these positives have. People will sometimes say that positivism is apolitical. Bull. <laughs> Read through Hempel's what he's doing. That's a very clear set of political claims that make a lot of sense in Central and Eastern Europe in the early part of the 20th century. That's the goal that these folks are, are trying to achieve in some ways. Um, that's interesting because, of course, most people in, uh, in political science who self-identify as positivists these days are probably not concerned to rule out destiny of a race as a scientific concept. It's not really, they're not really all that hostile to metaphysics either, right? But that was the big thing that the Vienna Circle positivists were into. After the Vienna Circle positivists, here's where the terminology gets a little even weirder. We end up with these folks who, uh, in terms of the philosophy of science, are known as post-positivists. That's a term that means something very different in the philosophy of science than it does over here in the social sciences. Um, because again, positivism means something different, so we think post-positivism is different. But really, the post-positivists are people who came along and said, you know, Knowledge can't simply come from observation. Knowledge has to come from someplace else. And it can't come from, you know, omphaloskepsis, contemplation of one's navel. It has to come from somewhere else. Knowledge has got to come from something different than just empirical observation. And it can't just come full blown out of your head. Um, there are some people who end up using these Kantian notions about sort of categorical imperatives of perception. But that gets us into territory we don't need to get into right now. The main line of attack was led by this gentleman named Karl Popper. 
Popper himself an Austrian uh, critic of the Vienna Circle, um, very annoyed at not being made part of the Vienna Circle, um, but decided to bring the whole thing down. And basically Popper's innovation is to say, you know, knowledge doesn't come from observing stuff. Knowledge comes from positing claims and then testing them against observation. So not observation first, it's hypothesis testing. Right? Falsification being the particular term that Popper introduces. And if we know no other philosophy of science and political science, we know falsification because we know hypothesis testing because that's embedded into what it is we do. We may not associate it with the name of Popper. We should. Part of the point of associating it with Popper is to demonstrate that there are, in fact, alternatives. This is Popper's understanding of knowledge construction. After Popper, though, because Popper's doing this stuff in the 30s and 40s, right on into the 50s perhaps, you then get this huge fragmentation in the philosophy of science where people go off in all sorts of different directions. Nowadays, we have at least three kind of going concerns in the philosophy of science. We have realism, not, which doesn't mean what it often means within, uh, within political science, but realism in philosophy of science sense means that knowledge touches a mind-independent world. There's a world out there. Knowledge has to somehow correspond to it. Um, that, and this is, there, there are names like Hilary Putnam, uh, who sometimes get tossed around in IR, Roy Bascar, another one who uh, has some currency within international relations. So realist philosophies of science. You have critical theories which is the idea that knowledge, in fact, plays a role in the social order. There's a weird path from the Vienna Circle where some of the cr critics of the Vienna Circle decided to have a separate circle, and they set it up in Frankfurt. And they became, but they decided not to be a circle. They decided to be a school. So they became the Frankfurt School. Um, Horkheimer, Adorno, eventually Jürgen Habermas comes out of this, right? So names you might have heard tossed around. The whole idea of, the, of the, this kind of critical theory is where knowledge participates in the social order, where you, the researchers, stand in the social order affects things. So this gets very much into this idea that knowledge is itself a sociological intervention, right? and it can be critical of the existing social order. Um, and then, of course, we have pragmatism the sort of American contribution to this debate, which is the idea that, in fact, truth means nothing other than use value. If something works, then it is true. Knowledge doesn't have to correspond to anything. Knowledge doesn't necessarily have to critique the existing social order. Knowledge has to be useful for getting done what you want it to get done. This is very quick, obviously. There's a lot of nuance that could be going into with these things. There's overlap between these folks in interesting ways. But there's at least these kinds of schools. Now, what's interesting is that all of these and even others still continue to exist in the philosophy of science. It's fascinating if you try to find textbooks in the philosophy of science because they will mention these things, and then people sort of throw their hands up. They don't quite know how to organize it. It's like, uh, there's a lot of stuff. So what people usually do is they just do it chronologically. Okay, so we'll go back and talk about Vienna, and we'll talk about Popper, and then we'll talk about some stuff that happens after that. And there's no sort of grand summative statement of these things. Lots of different kinds of schools. So clearly there's no consensus in the philosophy of science about what we should be doing. Parenthetically, where there is consensus among all of these folks is not in their substance, but in their relationship to science itself. Almost every single one of these folks is mostly interested in physics. There is a slight derivation within the critical theorists or sometimes, sometimes interested in social theory. But for the most part, philosophy of science is interested in natural science and almost exclusively in physics. Why is that important? Well, it's important because most philosophers of science have this very apparent success of physics. The computer works. Their job is to try to explain why the computer works. What does it mean that our knowledge has somehow produced the computer or the airplane that flies reliably on a normal basis? Which is to say, to introduce a technical philosophical term for a second, that all of the work, and most, almost all the work in philosophy of science is what we call transcendental. It takes an existing set of empirics and it tries to explain the conditions for its possibility. So the question for the philosophy of science is, how is physics possible? Right, how is physics possible? How is, how is biology possible? which assumes that it works to start out with. Right? So none of these folks are trying to say, how would we build a biology from scratch? Which is interesting, because when it gets translated over to us, that's how we read them. We read them as if they're telling us how to build a science from scratch, when what they're doing is making a transcendental argument about how sciences that already exist are possible. So caution about these things. I do, however, think that there are some things we can derive from this. I'm going to mention what they are, we're going to have a coffee break, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about the specific lexicon. I think there are basically three things that we want out of the philosophy of science. I think we want to be able to know whether the critiques we're making of other people's claims are constructive. 
right? We want to know, okay, if I want to say to someone, the, there's a mismatch here between the kind of questions you're asking and the kind of techniques you're using. I want to have some sense that that's a reasonable critique. Philosophy of science can help us do that by articulating the implication of different kinds of commitments. I think that uh, philosophy of science is also a place that we can turn for some practical advice about how we do our own research. We can say, all right, here are the logical implications of certain commitments. So if I have these commitments, this is the kind of work that maybe I want to be engaged in. And then the third thing, I think, and this gets us to this methodology level, is to think about a positive warrant for our own research practices. So if somebody says, you shouldn't interview, you should do surveys. It would be nice to have a response to that that wasn't just based on the technical impossibility of doing a survey in the country. Right? It would be nice to be able to say, you know, there's actually a positive methodological reason why I want those face-to-face -face interviews, why I want that participant observation. So even if you gave me the grant money to go ahead and run a survey, there would be no methodological reason for me to do so. And it is defensible that I can say that. Right? So I think we can get that by thinking about these in philosophy of science terms. This is not what the philosophers of science are interested in. This is not what they do. Our scholarship in political science is not, by any stretch of the imagination, an intervention into philosophy of science debates. We are not going to solve their problems. We should not try to solve their problems. We should not try to become philosophers of science. That's not our job. But I do think that there are things that we can learn. There is a better vocabulary for talking about our own empirical research practices derived from this. I am not advocating that we all become philosophers. I am advocating that we learn some of the language that they have introduced. And when we get back from coffee break, I want to introduce a few terms based on a reading of some of these folks. So let's have a coffee break. <laughs>